I would say this is my first time actually here, but uh, full disclosure, I have a son at this university. Don't worry, he's not in the same sort of area as me. He's an art student. Uh, so I've been planning to come over here, so we're all good. So um, what am I going to be talking about here today? Uh, deploying a cloud-based red team attack infrastructure. That title's got so, so many questions already in it. So um, I suppose the subtitle in there, it's not all about the breaking in. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we actually do uh, in the world of red teaming, having to actually educate people about what a red team is and is not, and how it actually complements uh, other cybersecurity initiatives and roles up there. So, a um, bit about me I'm a red team operator for a Fortune 500 company. I've been in information security for about 15 years. Uh, Fun fact, everybody kind of thinks it's odd that my first degree wasn't computing science or computers or anything like that. It was in media studies. So uh, my way into information security was by no means uh, normal, but I don't think there is a normal route into this industry whatsoever. It's so, so diverse uh, from all different uh, backgrounds and sort of uh, people's experiences, and it's all the more richer for them. Uh, I started off uh, with, uh, in, I basically had all of my experience in information security largely with one company. And uh, I've done everything from tech writing right through to red teaming in here. Uh, I had been a, a former web developer back whenever the internet was taking off. So that gives you a clue how old I actually am. Um, I actually Program started off programming uh, Mac-based touchscreen kiosks shaped like wedges of cheese. I kid you not. That's how I started off. Uh, but as my current employer, uh, I did a lot of work with developers in secure application development, training them in things such as the OWASP top 10, things like that. And I've also uh, been very fortunate to lead a, a, a process track of work uh, for my employer. Uh, in security architecture to embed security of all aspects of a software development life cycle. I'm very careful about mentioning the words like agile and waterfall. Back in those days, waterfall was the only show in time, by the way. Uh, but uh, I've also just uh, I got involved in pen testing itself, uh, specifically around about 2013. Uh, whenever mobile application development uh, was uh, really taking off, I specialized a lot in mobile app security, not because it was new for my employer, but because it was just new full stop. So I did a lot of funky stuff there to do with uh, reverse engineering mobile apps. Uh, I specialized a lot in mobile cryptography, that sort of stuff, so it was all fun. Uh, then I wanted to do something different, and I wanted to actually move into red teaming. I will go into that, how that actually differs uh, from pen testing a bit. So uh, I used to hate automation. I remember once uh, walking into a, a new department where I work at, and they'd actually started work on Agile and Agile XP, extreme paired programming, <coughs> and um, they didn't like to see the likes of me coming. Uh, it was uh, security was a block, so it was. Um, so I used to hate automation for all the wrong reasons. Now I absolutely love it because whenever we're trying to cover things at scale, and as you'll find out when we talk about red teaming, we're not just hitting one specific machine or a small set of uh, IPs or a subnet. We're having to take a look at thousands of uh, machines and IP addresses. Just trying to do that at scale does require some uh, automation. Um, other bits of interest in there, occasional t-shirt winner, what that boils down to is I do some responsible disclosure and things like that. Um, I can talk about it offline off the uh, LinkedIn, uh, but I have some, some stuff for the CERN Large Hadron Collider project. I've done some bits and pieces with them which is a fun experience uh, and a hard way to earn a t-shirt because that's how they paid. Um, also, uh, I cycle a bit, I'm not always tied to a computer, so all good. So today, 
this is the bit why I do a lot of education, not just with good folks like yourselves, but also when I'm actually having to hand the report over to different customers, as it were, within uh, where I actually work at my employer. Um, we are actually a lot different from penetration testing. And because I mentioned there, but we have to do things at scale and really quickly, and the, the cloud is actually the, the big thing, not just for what we do, but the things that we have to actually test. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges about setting up a red team attack infrastructure. And I'm not saying that automation is my savior about this at all, not at all, but uh, I do see it as uh, an opportunity to help us actually innovate and to, to move quickly. But as you'll also see, there's an opportunity for an attacker in a cloud infrastructure as well, uh, which is going to be fun. And there will be some demos. Uh, so, OK, just moving along. So I'll summarize all of this stuff in here. Uh, how does pen testing differ from red teaming? Back in my AppSec pen testing days, before an application would go out the door, we would be told, right, Leo, here's an application or a small system comprising of a small number of IP addresses. Um, you will have access to a test environment. Please tell me where the dead bodies are with that application. What vulnerabilities can you find? We're very much led by things such as like the OWASP top 10, et cetera. So quite a narrowish scope, so to speak. Uh, uh, which is fine because people wanted to make sure that their product or their system was as secure as it could be to protect all of those aspects of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Very, very important. But red teaming is very, very, very different, and this is why I love it so much. We're really about adversary simulation. So how does that actually differ? Aren't you just breaking stuff? No. Um, we're principally goal-based. Instead of someone saying to us, okay, find the vulnerabilities in that system, we're now actually seeing business leaders come to my team and say, right, Leo, we have a specific concern about this type of data. Can you get it? Now, it's, I would say uh, it's not by any means possible. It's by any means possible authorized by a, uh, by a lawyer in writing. Uh, we are pretty tightly governed. So, we may actually have to cover a lot of ground with thousands upon thousands of machines. They're interested in a type of data. It doesn't have to be specific to one application or system. It could spread over many systems, many subnets, a lot of different technologies. So it's not just about doing a vulnerability scan and you're done or doing an, a, a, an application security assessment where you're looking at things such as, but not limited to the OWAS top 10. So uh, we are goal driven, we're, we're after data, that's the new goal for us. So, so with that out of the way, um, we do a lot of work now in the cloud uh, because, you know, like in any modern company, you're trying to actually, you know, like be more agile, lower the time to market, be flexible with your investments, the less need for data centers, all of that lovely good stuff. Um, the things that we're having to test are moving more towards the cloud. And we've also found in there as well is that it makes sense for us to live in the cloud as well because we don't have a company-owned data center to hide behind. And this idea of attackers coming in from the cold from the outside, that really fits in well with us because we can have our own uh, uh, infrastructure out there in the cloud that's actually going to attack it as if it was a real adversary from outside. So it works well for us. Uh, those attack infrastructures don't actually um, sort of just arrive on their own. We have to build them. And the funny thing is, that in a red team, now, I'm probably doing a lot more coding and scripting than I've ever done before. Uh, the types of tasks that we have to actually do, uh, they're just so, so diverse in terms of technologies. Uh, anything that we want to automate, if we have to do it more than once, we try to automate it. It's just so uh, uh, complex to do it manually. Um, so we try to actually sort of, you know, like live with the times and we need to be able to move really, really quickly and get up and running. So for us, the, 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 you know, the cloud is our, is our home a lot of the time. <coughs> okay. Um, our goal is to actually make 
a company or help make a, an organization become more secure. Um, the old idea about the red versus blue, you're familiar with that concept, the attackers versus the defenders. What we are never about in the red team is about proving the blue team wrong. That is not going to make the company more secure. Uh, we're certainly about testing uh, the defensive capabilities uh, of the people that we work for, uh, because it's important that we can see both sides of the coin. Where are they, the weaknesses? And are we actually able to uh, detect those sorts of attacks? And if not, how can we actually make the blue team better at doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is defending the organization. So um, we're really about that, as opposed to breaking things. Now, don't get me wrong, when I was coming in here tonight, uh, I was saying to Harsha that uh, it's a double-edged sword for us. Uh, occasionally, we may actually uh, accomplish something that's sort of technically very challenging. And you know, like, that's a great sense of accomplishment, doing that. But at the same time, you realize there's a lot of responsibility there, that there's maybe an issue that needs to be addressed quickly. So we're really, really aware of what we actually do. And we don't live in any sort of moral vacuum. We have a responsibility to our employers, to our customers. And let's be selfish about this, our own paychecks. So it's all, it's all good. Okay. Um, a lot of the time as well, um, I would, you know, um, doing something complex for an operation, we may actually want to model a test environment up because the last thing we want to do is just go in and throw an exploit at a system. Maybe that's a critical production system. We don't want to cause a denial of service, but we want to be as responsible as possible to actually narrow down any risk to the business. We want to prove if something is vulnerable, of course, but uh, we do a lot of modeling. And if anybody's interested, I've actually got a, a GitHub repo. I'll give links to it later. If you want to have an Active Directory playground, for instance, you want to try out some fancy new attack mechanism, uh, I've got some stuff in there that will allow you to spin up uh, a Windows-based network um, scenario. It's based on VirtualBox, et cetera, but it could easily migrate to the cloud, all that sort of good stuff. So anyhow, moving along. Um, and for us nowadays, it is rarely a case of point, shoot, click, go, in the old Hollywood saying, I'm in. Um, no, it's not like that at all for us. Um, what we find now is that organizations are becoming a lot, lot more mature in terms of the basics, such as patching, um, configuration management, and things like that. Now we're trying to focus some of our energies as well, when we need to, um, on layer eight the carbon layer, the humans. Um, that's where social engineering comes in. Sounds pretty seedy, but it's not. It's it's designed to actually sort of uh, identify gaps and plug those gaps. So talking about uh, a red team attack infrastructure, what on earth am I talking about in here? So I'm not going to sort of go through this verbatim. I can talk about this on its own for an hour and a day. So okay. Um, with our uh, attack infrastructures, this is just a, it's not a carbon copy of what we do all of the time. Just to give you an idea in here, you see poor old victim here, and then there's Massey me up here at the top, the red team operator. And we talked about social engineering. We're going to be talking maybe possibly a phishing based attack first. So we actually maybe have a phishing server which sends out. Uh, Malicious emails. Well, they're not really malicious. They're out to prove a point, but they're not going to actually uh, turn someone's hard drive into an encrypted partition. And we ask them to pay us. It's not that at all. But it could be a simple uh, mechanism in here is that we send a phishing email. And that, when it's clicked, potentially we might want to just go after people's credentials. It may not actually have payloads on it, but it might. And um, so we could actually have. Uh, a link and launch to a payload in here, and that will actually install an agent potentially on the victim's machine, which then phones home to a command and control <coughs> server uh, or, or a C2. And you can see these things in here called redirectors. What on earth are they? Well, we need to actually keep distance between the victims and us as much as possible. In the event 
that we get, do get detected and if we do get detected, we're actually very happy about that. Uh, but these things take a bit of time to actually set up. You have to purchase domains and install SSL and all that lovely good stuff. We don't want these things to be caught and they're burned and then we have to actually start again. We have simple redirectors in here, maybe with a different set of domains. And they will actually just literally just forward the traffic on to the next part of the chain. If these things get burned, um, you know, like it's just a, a simple teardown, stand up another server, and we're good. Uh, so that actually gives us distance between ourselves and the victims uh, because um, some of it's more longer term, but some of it's more shorter time. Uh, for instance, we may actually have servers that we think, okay, well, they're pretty throwaway. We want to do just one task. But maybe if we want a server that does a particular type of task for us to live over a full length of the engagement, we don't want to burn too quickly. So that's why we have these three directors. So just moving along. Now, uh, what I am going to talk about in here is setting this stuff up. This could take a load of time. Now, I remember when I was starting out in this stuff, setting up a phishing server uh, manually could take an afternoon. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, uh, if you've never actually set up a server before, I wouldn't say just jump to automation. I think there's a lot of value having to do this the hard way the first time you do it, because you need to understand the core concepts of what needs to go in to make that an effective part of your attack infrastructure. Um, but eventually, you, you really don't want to be having to do that. I call it sys, uh, hacker sysadmin time or hacker min, something like that. Uh, you want to get on with the business of hacking. Now, take a look at this one in here, and uh, you can see in here, this is just on a phishing box. If you're going to do this manually, and you're on a cloud provider such as, well, you can have your AWSs, this word, whatever it happens to be, you could log into a control panel in there. You could say, I want to spin up a server, a raw server that does these things. Then you actually have to make sure that it's all up to date. And then you've got DNS records, because you're going to actually have some really useful, um, highly targeted domain name. That all has to be set up. Um, obviously, if you're going to have phishing servers and payload servers and all that sort of good stuff, uh, SSL, because we got to eat our own dog food. Uh, so certificates, it's fine. Then we get to the bit of installing attack components. Now, if anybody here has ever had to uh, set up a mail server, this can be a real pain to do this manually. If you actually want to turn this into something that's going to be of a red team specific nature, such as a phishing server, it gets even more difficult because we have to navigate an array of really, really good controls that are designed to actually stop us, which is great. But you know, like you've got all sorts of things such as like uh, sender policy framework and lots of other really good controls that are designed to make sure, is this email really coming from Leo or whatever organization he reports it to be? Does this look authentic? Does it come from a proper domain? Is somebody actually doing SNTB relay from somewhere else? All that sort of good stuff. There's a lot of hoops to jump through there. Doing it manually is going to take a long time. And it's also going to be problematic. We're humans. Uh, we do make mistakes. So a lot of stuff in there to actually do, and then the testing. And before that, my cat decides to leave home. So human problems, scalability, speed, consistency, and repeating ourselves and reinventing the wheel. With the best will in the world, you know, like me actually doing this task today, set up a mailbox, if I was to say to a coworker, can you do this now? They may actually have their own spin up, which is fine because we always want to innovate and get better. But you know, like we can be inconsistent. We may actually forget certain steps. Um, that's just one server. We've got a whole bunch of others sitting within there. We've got a limited time to do all of this stuff, and we need to get moving quickly. So humans sometimes can be the problem. So more time on that stuff, less time on the attack operation. We need a different approach in here. Uh, this is where I get to talk about my favorite subject at the moment, infrastructure as code. What that really means is that can I actually take all of those bits about an offensive infrastructure and define them as code? So 
call it a recipe book if you want, where you can just point the computer at some code and magically out of thin air, these new servers arrive. Um, I must admit the first time I actually did this stuff, it was like, oh, wow, that worked. Uh, when you know, it soon passes, whenever you've spun up a server on a cloud somewhere on one data center in Europe, and then you say, no, I don't like that. Can I actually have that in the US? That's pretty cool. So it's been able to do that, define this as actually lines of code. We're talking about, here's what I want done, but I don't need to get bogged down in the mechanics of how you're going to do it. I've given it a recipe, uh, the, the actual code itself, and let it worry about how all that works. So the idea in here is that if you can feed the computer some code to spin up your infrastructure, it's going to address the issues of scalability and the consistency issues in there. That's really good. But also the standardization, it means now that if I actually uh, we call it, develop some stuff, I can hand this over to a coworker and they're going to be able to spin this up. Obviously, they change a few parameters like domain names and types of components they actually want. But that's a good thing. But you know, at the end results the same. They get an infrastructure up and running very, very, very click, uh, quickly. Um, we hear a lot about code reuse. Uh, not all of it very good. But personally, I'm seeing the benefits of this and my own sort of uh, capabilities to uh, work at scale. There's two aspects to this infrastructure as code. Um, orchestration and configuration management. Now, if anybody's into uh, cloud automation, uh, there's a, a lot of debate about what orchestration and configuration management really are. These are my takes on these things. What it really boils down to is orchestration is basically where you want to get raw servers up and running. That definition of a server in terms of code, I want a server. Then we actually apply configuration management to say, right, that server is now going to be a functional entity whether it be a payload server or a command and control framework, there's software behind that, there's configuration requirements around it. All of that will be good stuff that we want to be able to automate. So take raw servers, spin them up, and then make them useful according to a, a specific functional requirement. So first one about getting the raw servers up and running. Uh, I use a tool called Terraform uh, quite a bit. And I use this to build the basic infrastructure. My apologies if you can't really see this too well. You can see some stuff in here uh, at the bottom. And what it's really saying is that I have a cloud provider called Linode. Others are available. And what it's saying here is that I want a server using a specific operating system. In this case, it's actually Ubuntu. I want to spun up in a specific data center, European West. Um, I want a specific size of server. I don't really need a huge one. Just a small one will do me fine. And um, by the way, I want to be able to log into it with a set of SSH keys. And um, do you mind making that so? Now, if you were to run that code, there's obviously a few other pieces of code, configuration files, and variables, etc., which I'm not going to go into right now. But that's the raw building block of it there. So it's like, um, off you go. Terraform. It's based on GoLang. And um, it's, it's pretty fast. And what it really does is all these different types of cloud providers, they all have their own APIs exposed as to how you can actually interact with their servers or services to build servers. Um, Terraform is, your, is the person or is the, the tool that actually talks to all of these different APIs. It's got providers for each of these cloud uh, services. So whether it's actually the node, digital ocean, AWS, whatever. They all publish their own providers. Terraform can talk to those. Uh, it's cross-platform, um, so this will actually work in uh, in Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows if you want to. Uh, by the choice, I'm more increasingly Linux-based these days. So the Terraform stuff with that code that you just saw there, the very brief snippet of it, there's three steps to, to get this up and running. Terraform in it, basically says set up the environment so we can detect in here, oh, right, you're going to talk to that cloud provider. I need to download the plugin, um, which is all really it's doing. It's just getting itself ready to build. Plan, it is what it says in here. Uh, there are other things that we'll actually do, but it's sort of like a 
pre-flight check mechanism to make sure that it's syntactically correct and there's nothing you know blatantly missing or wrong about it. And then this one, Terraform apply, basically build it up, go. Funny story actually happened last week when I was showing some stuff like this to my boss, and he says, "You can create this stuff very quickly. How quickly can you get rid of it?" So I showed him an, another command, Terraform destroy, and I says, "Be very careful." <laughs> What do you mean? When it's gone, it's gone. So if you've got any important data up on that server, make sure it's backed up before you do this first. Now there's a whole talk on its own based on operational security and being safe with all of this stuff uh, to make sure you don't trash your own environment. Doing a denial of service and your stuff is not cool, folks. Uh, but you know, it's pretty simple uh, to work in here. And then you're up and running. Um, so you are. Ansible is basically taking those raw boxes and it's converting them to actually do something useful. So talked about different things such as fishing servers, command and control, payload servers. This is right, I'm gonna take those and make them useful. So um, I like Ansible a lot for configuring servers. Others are available like Puppet, Chef, all that sort of stuff. I'm not knocking those whatsoever. But one of the big things why I like dealing with Ansible is agentless. If you're on a Linux environment, the only thing you need to be able to configure that machine with uh, Ansible is SSH-based access. And if you're on Windows, you can see WinRM over port 5985 and 5986. Uh, sorry for poking on Windows. It's just a force I have it in here. Um, works really well with Terraform. You'll see that in some of the demos that I've got in here. Really, really good. Easy to follow syntax in here called YAML. Um, it's, I would call it procedural. You tell it what you want and it does it for you. Um, so let's take a look in here. Uh, some basic building blocks to create what they call an Ansible playbook, um, similar to what it is in sport. Uh, playbooks like a series of commands or sort of a plan of attack uh, in an operation. Uh, but we talk about roles quite a bit in here in Ansible. Now you can see this is actually from an Active Directory project I've actually been working on. It's published in GitHub right now. You can see in here um, roles, common member server and MSSQL. Um, I have actually got a complete role in here of everything that you actually need to build yourself an SQL server, uh, an MSSQL server. Um, that is really, really, really useful. If you need it to be the main joined, I've got a role for that. And if you need every server in your infrastructure to have a baseline configuration in terms of patching levels and extra components you want onto it, I've got all of that here. So just those what five lines of code can I actually make you a Windows box, which is the main joined and is a database server. Um, very, very handy in this one. So a role is just really a series of collated tasks. Everything that you actually need to be a database server, What? this is how you package it up. Oh, a bit too far. Then we get tasks. So if we've got a database server, in here you can see some installation files in here. Files that need to be copied over. We might need certificates created. We need folders created. We maybe need account set up. All of that. All of the individual steps that otherwise you'd be sitting there back in the day feeding the computer a bunch of disks and typing stuff in. Uh, this is all in here. The good thing about doing this, there's a lot of really good stuff published out in the web that you can actually pick up and reuse. And I've benefited from that. Um, for me, it's about adding extra value to it, but the fact that's why I've actually published this stuff up on GitHub. So, I'm not going to read all of that verbatim, but this is basically a snippet of building an SQL server box. Then there's the, the playbooks. So, you've got all of those roles which are comprised of tasks. And in here, you can see in here is what I'm essentially doing with these three commands. I've got individual playbooks for things such as domain controllers, member servers, and a workstation. What this really is, is build me my Active Directory infrastructure, because I need to model up some sort of complex attack. This is my nice playground in three lines in here. Now, 
there's a lot of stuff behind it, but you get the idea. So very quickly moving along in here, what does all of this mean? I've gone from taking an afternoon, at least two and a half hours, building a fishing box to building an attack infrastructure, sometimes in as little as 20 minutes. Consistent, repeatable, reliable, the code, not me, uh, reusable, extend, all those really good things. It really does work well. I spend also a lot less time in testing this stuff. For instance, there is a role in there called common, which every server would get. So all the baseline stuff, I haven't looked at that in some cases for maybe a couple of months because I'm pretty happy with it. It just works, I've tested it. So that's pretty good. So you can just move along so you can. But with all of this good stuff, uh, building an attack infrastructure, um, that infrastructure can also be attacked and weaponized. So what do I mean by that? Well, as a red teamer, the last thing I want to happen is to get pwned myself. That's not really good uh, whenever you're trying to negotiate your salary uh, raise at the end of the year. Um, but also as a red teamer, if you're hitting an environment and you land on something where you can see evidence of dealing with Ansible or Terraform, there is gold in the hills in there. Uh, potentially. Uh, it's not that, as I argue in here, that these things are intentionally vulnerable by nature. It's done to humans and the decisions we make to configure these environments. So this is king in here, uh, being able to do this uh, stuff with a uh, security mindset. But again, well, let's take a look in here what we've got. Now, uh, let's give you a scenario in here where I've built an environment up with Terraform and someone actually gets a foothold on it or i've actually i've got a foothold on someone else's machine and i'm doing a look around one of the first things we'll do when we get a foothold in the box is what does it do so there are some things now if i'm in the cloud environment i'm looking for specifically terraform one of the things i go for in here is this terraform.ps8 it's like a complete library of sentences. If you're standing up an infrastructure, it's almost like a two-year-old being able to repeat everything back to you. So it is. It's really, really important stuff. Now, down in here, you can see some of that TS file. Okay, it's talking about authorized keys and labels, what distribution I'm using. And then you see this root pass, super secret password. This is gold. Now, all the state people would be like raising their heads and think, passwords label, not SSH keys. Just let me get around that bit. <laughs> but if I jump onto a Terraform box, I call them build boxes. Those boxes that build the infrastructure. And I can see this. You can be pretty well assured that this is actually the, you see it, root pass. This is a root password. You can be pretty well assured that it's the same account, the same credentials that are going to be used to spin off every machine in that infrastructure. Ooh. So now I could that potentially SSH into each of those boxes and get them to do my bidding for me, actually let them become a part of my attacking structure, or better, I'm goal driven. Can I just go straight into those boxes and pick out some really useful data in there, such as like the information from a database or uh, of the, the pay raise information, an Excel spreadsheet, whatever. So that's actually pretty bad. If you're doing anything with Terraform, one piece of advice I would give you, if you use uh, source code repository mechanisms like GitHub, don't put those files on them <laughs> uh, because it, it's pretty bad. So it is. So that's a, a, a nice, neat way of uh, doing lateral movements, um, going after data elsewhere once you've got an initial foothold. Now, Ansible. The attack scenario isn't here is that I've got access, root access, to a box that is uh, responsible for being what I call it in here, a controller. It's got responsibility to go out to a bunch of machines, and they call it an inventory, a list of hosts that it actually administers, and it's actually going to configure those boxes to do lots of different things. Now, this is the bit you have to shift left a bit. It's not just an attack infrastructure. This could actually be the latest and greatest uh, sort of server infrastructure for the new company website, whatever it happens to be in here. 
And one of the things I look for is uh, a host file. Now it's not Etsy hosts that you actually have in there to make uh, to do lookups and things like that. This is a list of machines that an Ansible controller, that machine that's actually doing all the configuration management for a bundle of machines. It's in here you can see Windows, Windows children, domain controllers, member servers, workstations. Uh, put it simply, if this was a bit like Harry Potter, this is the Marauders map. This is telling you where everything's at. Uh, so if I've got access to this, by definition, Ansible has to be able to have administrative access to those boxes. If it's going to install things on it, if it's going to actually do things that are of an administrative nature, well, they need the creds to do it. So if I spy this, I'm going, oh, what could I do with this? Then I've actually developed this Ansible playbook. It looks sort of innocuous. Now, the last thing I would really want to do is to go and put a binary file up in there that says um, lead hacker executable.exe, whatever it happens to be up there. It would look too obvious. On the surface of it, I'm picking on Oracle in here. I'm blending in with my environment. If we have any blue team people who are doing routine sort of inspections of servers or indeed the people who maybe own part of that infrastructure, well, take a look at this. Oh, this is some sort of playbook in here that's going to install some sort of client setup utility for Oracle. Looks sort of pretty good. Now, there's probably deeper questions in here about that binary that I'm referring to, client setup.exe. You'd obviously want to make sure that this had actually been AB scanned and all of that sort of good stuff. And you're going to make sure that you're trying to get past any defenses, that it's encrypted, and it's not going to trip any sort of wires in the defensive infrastructure. So this looks reasonable. So we might just think, well, this thing's supposed to be installing things. Let it go. But it's anything but normal. Let's take a look at this. Now, uh, pre-recorded demo, made this earlier. Okay, uh, I'm running two uh, terminal sessions in here. First one is going to be me on that Ansible controller, that machine that actually does all the configuration management for lots of servers. On the bottom in here, this could be your command and control framework. Now, you can have things such as like uh, Cobalt Strike, Merlin, um, there's lots of different C2 frameworks, command and control frameworks. Again, worthy of a talk on their own. Don't have the time today. For demonstration purposes in here, I'm just using Metasploit. Strictly speaking, it's not a command and control framework. It's an exploit framework. I would actually argue. But for today, this will be pretty good. What I would like to do, if I've got onto Ansible box, can I actually deploy my client setup and get access to some of those juicy boxes, get them to phone home to me. And then once I've established a, a session on each of those boxes, can I go after credentials? Perhaps I need to have domain administrator credentials as a means to an end. Maybe I need to have other people's credentials uh, to get more data. So let's take a look at this. So we can see in here, first of all, uh, I've decided to be really cheeky about this one and set up myself a system account on it. I've called it magically SysDBA Utilities. And now I'm saying it's like, right, to one of those servers that's impacted by this, can you pull down this client setup utility in here? And once you've done that, can you activate it? Now you take a look down in here. Perturbator session one opened. It's phoned back home, so to speak. You can see it got credentials here with uh, it's a session in the context of SysDBA utils, which is fine. Intentionally vulnerable, by the way, folks. So I want to go for system in here, get system. I want to actually completely own this box. And while I'm there, can I actually dump all of the hashes in here? So this is a domain controller, and I've taken all of the hashes. Yes, you could run other tools in there if you want to clear text passwords. But I'm trying not to be as obvious. So simple situation for some of us to stumble upon that setup doesn't look too bad. 
Uh, but now I've got that to phone home, I've got control of all of it, and I've dumped the domain controller's hashes. So at that stage, you could say game over, but I would stress in a red team scenario, you don't always need to be a domain controller to get what you want. If you're goal driven, you're after data. Just a, dis a disclaimer there to my boss if he's listening. Um, big thing I want to say in here, I asked this before, does this mean we should stop using this stuff? I'm going, no, 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 no. Use them, but use them responsibly. They're not intentionally vulnerable themselves. I'm not saying that the vendors might actually release something that has a real problem in it now and again, but this is all down to the choices we actually make. It's all about getting the basics right, your system hardening, being able to actually install it and take a look at the manufacturer supply defaults to make sure that it's done right. For instance, when I was developing some of the stuff uh, late last year, I believe that specific version of Ansible at the time didn't actually have logging in, uh, turned on by default. Good logs are important, folks. So if you don't have logs, that's a, it's a bit of a problem. So getting all of the basics right, authentication, authorization, accountability, all of those things you actually need. Now, there's just one more thing I want to talk about here tonight in the time that I've got with you folks. Um, I showed you some really cool stuff about how you can create Ansible playbooks, that stuff in the nice YAML syntax, it's human readable. Showed you a very brief snippet in there about uh, creating a basic machine with Terraform. But if you're like some of my coworkers who are, you know, we're all strapped for time, they maybe actually have a very specific requirement to do something quickly. They want to be operational right now. They don't want to be flicking out the books and saying, right, learn Ansible tonight, Dale. Well, sometimes that does happen, but uh, I, I pondered this problem. And um, I thought, right, there's something I can actually do in here to get us up to speed really, really quickly in here. Obviously, a red teamer is going to actually have a very, very good idea, uh, uh, firm plans about what it is they actually need. Well, I need a phishing box, Leo. I need a command and control framework. I need this, that, and the other. I need some SSL certificates. I need all of these things. But how does this work, Leo? How does this magic work? This is where I developed the tool, which is still an internal beta right now. Um, it's called Red Engine. You do not need to be a Terraform or Ansible specialist to do this. I've done a lot of the hard work in here for you. And what this tool does, it asks you, okay, well, what sort of things do you want? Do you want phishing boxes? Do you want payload servers? What domains do you want? Do you need SSL certificates? All of that complexity around building a phishing server. The only reason I mention this is because this is the most complex bit of the lot. Phishing servers, they just are. And um, I want it to be able to be expandable in here, add things onto it. And whenever it's done, can you notify things to Slack to tell me you're through? All of that sort of good stuff. And uh, when I showed this to my boss a while back, he sat and pondered. He went quiet. And he says, so Terraform and Ansible are automation tools. Uh -huh. So this is automating the automation. Yes, just try to get your head around that, which is interesting. It's at an internal beta right now. We are actually working to get this published. Some of that involves our, uh, sort of getting permission from our legal people uh, because uh, it's you know, like uh, we don't want to give anything super sensitive to be top secret. We don't believe we are, uh, but we're working to do this to give something back to the community in here. So we want to see a demo of this. Let's take a look. So I'm just going to have to quit out of this. And Hopefully this will not mess up too much in here. So apologies if we can't actually see too much in here. If any people want to see a lot more of this, I've got tons of demos and things around. So it's basically a Python 3 application. Uh, that was another good reason why I wanted to do this. I wanted to sharpen up my Python 3 skills now that Python 2.7 should be buried somewhere. So and rather imaginatively, I've called this Red Engine. Now, there's eight minutes of this. I'm not going to make you sit through all of this, folks. So I'll just start through the first maybe minute or so, and then I'll zoom magically to the last minute of it as well. 
So it's a pretty basic menu-driven system in here. It's a console-based application. And it's going to start off saying, well, what domains do you actually want to create? OK, yeah. OK. It's going to start off by asking, us that, OK, well, have you got a bunch of domains that you actually want to start off with? And this one is called Blinky Boxes. Uh, it was a bit of an in-joke to some of our, uh, yep, cool, thank you. Uh, it was a bit of an in-joke. Whenever I was in a, a meeting with some of our blue team people, um, they liked having some really cool stuff, don't we all? And I called it Blinky Boxes, so I thought, okay, uh, buy a domain for 99p, um, it was blinkyboxes.xyz. By the way, uh, don't ever use a .xyz or Z domain for real red team operations, they might get noticed. So you can see in here, I've said is that, okay, blinkyboxes.xyz, that's the domain I want to start with. Cloudflare, I'm using that for DNS management in here, and you need unique identifiers to refer to a given domain, and I'm just going to specify that right now. And there's a big long number, by the way, any of these numbers and keys and tokens, uh, by the time you've actually seen this tonight, they'll all be torn down. So just in case you were curious. So if you're going to be specifying a domain in here, in this case, I want a subdomain for mail if it's a phishing box. Uh, again, we could maybe talk more about this later if you want to, but if you create DNS records, they're all of different types at the very, very least. Uh, you're going to be looking for A records uh, for subdomains, things like that. And it's rather intelligent enough in here to say, right, well, I see you're doing a, uh, a domain in here. Do you also want to add in an MX record for mail? Which I'm going to say, yep. And now it's asked me, well, what cloud provider do you want? Now, initially for this, I'm just dealing with two DigitalOcean on the node. I have plans to expand this out so you can get a lot more choice. Other questions that I'm asking the user in here, well, uh, I'm doing the node. And uh, do you want a cheap one? Do you want an expensive one? Which is usually a trade up between cost and power. And in here, I've asked to build a fishing box. And you have other rules in here, such as redirectors and cloud, uh, sorry, uh, uh, command and control frameworks. So that's all I've said. Now it's asked me for a bunch of uh, tokens that I need to actually uh, use when spinning up my environments in the cloud. And this one has asked me for the node one. Uh, $5 a month, really cheap, really good. Um, so that's good. So now we're actually basically at the point now. At this, I just want to mention very, very quickly, up to that point, any of that fancy Terraform code I showed you earlier, it didn't exist. Within about a second of pressing that button, up it went. It's taken all of those things that I've given it and said, right, here's the actual Ansible code. And if anybody wants to see this, if they're a geek like me, whatever, and want to read that, I'm happy to show you some stuff. But uh, that stuff's starting up the servers right now. So you can see in here, it's already been talking to the Linode um, cloud provider and says, right, create this box. Um, it's going to take around about 40, 50 seconds. Now, after this bit, I'm going to fast forward a bit where I've got the basic server up and running. And then it says, right, you want to turn this into a phishing box. And it takes an Ansible playbook and goes through all the motions of setting that up, all of the sort of initial things, such as uh, getting updates to your operating system, uh, host names, and then installing the phishing software on that box, everything. So once that starts to kick in, folks, I'm going to magically zoom along towards the end of it because I don't think you want to watch another eight minutes of this. So anyhow, it's now about to jump into the Ansible stuff. All of those basic machines are now living. You can see in here, I've got some IP, an IP address. So that box is now living at that IP address or it's probably not right now, actually, I should say. So the DNS records up and running. Now we've got it here, Ansible stepping in, and it's running a playbook in here called 
uh, phishing.yml. And it's just turning that raw box into something very, very functional in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move along very, very quickly in here to the last bit in here. Oh, a bit too far, Leo. So it's done its run in here. It's actually finished. And what I want to be able to show you in here is that at least I can actually just log in to my newly completed uh, phishing server. I can see in here that there's confirmation of the IP address, the, the domains are actually up and running, all that sort of good stuff. And it's obviously waiting for me to do something else in here. So I'm SSHing into that box. And what you can't see on here as well is that uh, if I had another couple of screens, I would have done this. Um, I am able now to do local port forwarding. So there is an administration control panel running on the local interface for that phishing box. I need to be able to log into that to actually uh, administer my phishing campaigns and things like that. All working. There I am. I'm sitting on the, the phishing box right now. And you can see in here, that doing a net start operation, you can see the GoFish binary I'm using. GoFish is the name of the phishing framework I'm using. It's sitting there, it's running in the background, and it's ready for action. And um, here's the box that I've actually logged into. And here, um, it's actually running a local host in here for some port forwarding, so you'll forgive the self signed certificate in this. Uh, but one thing I would actually also mention in here. If you've got any public facing stuff that you want victims to actually click on, you really don't want to use self signed certificates. That's good because this whole system says, would you like SSL certificates? Why, yes, I would, Leo. Would you mind off going off to Let's Encrypt, generating those certificates, and then pushing them right up onto that server, please? Uh, if you're doing that on your own, it's a bit messy and fiddly. This does it all for you. So, um, that is a very, 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 very quick run through uh, what is Red Engine. As I said, it is internal beta right now. The intent is actually to get it published and to make it available for the community. But we believe it's a big step forward and allowing us to be able to get up and running very, very quickly where the emphasis is on, I need to do these things as opposed to I'm sitting here wasting time all afternoon and not being able to um, perform an operation. Um, so I've talked quite enough. Uh, my son would say I would talk even longer if I got the opportunity. If he's sitting quietly at the back, trying not to laugh. Um, I have some stuff in there up in GitHub. Um, occasionally on Twitter, I have a website for a bit of fun. I put up some articles about um, maybe some machines of hackthebox.eu. Um, where I've just done for a bit of fun, do it a bit of write ups and things like that. So, uh, questions, anybody? Ooh, Sorry. we're here, back in the room. Okay. So, hopefully, that was useful to you folks. I appreciate that this could seem like a fire hose of detail. Uh, I didn't want to make it too deep down, heavy duty technical. I could talk for a lot longer, and I do talk given half the chance, folks. Um, but I'm happy to um, show other stuff later. I'll be around for a bit here this evening. Um, I'm also going to be here tomorrow to uh, talk to some students about my journey into information security. So if any of you are actually coming along to tomorrow, uh, be more than happy to talk at length about how I get into this game. And uh, because uh, my, I said, I, I have, it's just a passion that I actually have uh, right now. So given I have the chance, I'll talk about it for a year and a day. So go ahead, sir. Leo, first let me say a huge thank you for no worries. Uh, this evening's, uh, it, it's been an outstanding presentation. So thank you very much. No worries. I'm about to ask you um, the impossible question. I'll try. Um, I'm delighted to hear that you're striving to publish this material. Yep. The question is, are you not concerned that bad people will get a hold of this and it will make their life 
uh, even easier. It means that they can spin off attack capabilities even more easily. No, not at all. And let me be very open and honest with that one. Uh, I, I mention a lot about phishing. To do a phishing campaign is hard. Because what I haven't touched upon in here is that trade craft that you need to have a convincing uh, phishing email. I haven't addressed issues either about uh, if you're going to actually have a malicious payload, uh, how difficult that is to try and bypass any endpoint security controls. The stuff that I actually have is, if you, if you compare it to maybe the American Gold Rush, this is the guy that who actually makes the picks and the shovels, the raw tools. By this in itself is not going to allow you or make you able to uh, own an environment anytime soon because you do need that tradecraft. You do need to be goal driven. It's not a point, shoot, click, and win exploitation framework. These are the tools that allow people to get up and running. If I was to hand this to a script kitty, and I'm trying not to be uh, sort of uh, like talking down in here, not at all. You can give some of the best tools in the world, but if they don't know what they're doing with them, and if they don't actually have a plan of action, they're going to fail because this is actually hard stuff. Never mind the tools. That's the easy bit to get right, but actually using them to actually, like in your case, maybe using them offensively against some other poor innocent organization, that's not what this tool is about. Um, like I've just taken lots of bits and made it work in an automated fashion but it's not an attack framework. So from that respect, I'm fully sort of happy with the fact is that I'm not doing anything that can be used for evil purposes. I'm not saying in here that some person on the other side of the planet might think, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. This will make life harder. Well, if they're that good, they already know how to do that. I'm, I, what I would say, I'm not talking this down here tonight. Uh, my teammates love this, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a bunch of Python code that just is pretty intelligent about the things that I asked you and the things that can grab with it. There's nothing really groundbreaking with that. I just happen to be the sucker that asked those questions in the middle of the night, what if? So hopefully that addresses some of your concerns, sir. Hopefully. Yeah, um, as I say, it's uh, an impossible question. It's, well, have you got any fuel for, you, you say you've got some um, lawyers to keep happy, have you got a, a sense of when you might be able to publish it? At this stage, we're hoping that this is going to be at some stage, potentially by the summer of this year. Uh, there's another reason why I want to delay as long as that. Uh, I like doing things a lot better. You saw in here that I've got just an example of Linode and DigitalOcean. And that's working OK. I want to make improvements so that the tool can be fully scalable. And um, there are a few tricks that I'm working on in there right now that could actually allow you to integrate with a cloud provider with no more than half an hour's notice, uh, completely independent of the tool, but it, it integrates well and plugs straight in. So there, there's two issues in there, getting the lawyers happy and getting to the stage where I'm totally happy that it's it's going to be beyond that beta stage. So you're not going to be sort of uh, hardwired into just two cloud providers. Um, there are maybe some instances, for instance, AWS, they're a bit more hands-on when it comes to setting up a cloud environment. Very, very briefly, if you're doing a server on Linode, you saw the lines of code in there. It wasn't all that great. You know, like what distribution do you want? What data center do you want? How big do you want it to be? And how much are you going to pay for it? Uh, AWS is different for a very good reason. If I spun up a server like that, it won't work. It has to have a security group applied to read that as a firewall rule set. Uh, applied to it. so you've got extra hoops to jump through and jump through in there before you can become operational so things like that there's a lot of so-called uh, business rules as I would call them that are specific to some cloud providers where I'm going right now is that I've got a really good proof of concept with two of them I've solved the harder problems first uh, believe it or not and now I'm ready say, right, okay, let's take this and make it much, much bigger. So if I can address the lawyer's concerns and then when I'm happy, and that may, that, that's a difficult task, making the lawyers happy and Leo happy. So that's the intent we're pushing for around about summer. Thank you.